Soak it up. When the Lord pours out his spirit out on all flesh, don't be afraid to soak it up. This becomes of extreme importance when you're delivered up before the Antichrist. If you don't soak it up, every bit of it, it could lead you to to commit the unforgivable sin. The Spirit of the Lord was poured out on many of the judges of Israel. Three things generally happened when the Spirit of God came upon the judges. One, they gained the ability to prophesy, to, to speak under divine inspiration. Two, they gained extreme uh, courage and strength, extraordinary strength and courage. And lastly, they gained the wisdom to keep Israel from forsaking God again by committing idolatry. We're going to document that if you will soak up the Spirit of God, that you will be able to speak boldly But let's first take a look at an example where the people of Israel were afraid to soak up the Spirit of God. Open your Bibles as we begin our study this evening to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 22. We ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. The first part of Deuteronomy chapter 5, we find the Ten Commandments. God gives them to them which is a witness to Exodus chapter 20, another place that the Ten Commandments are listed. But as we pick it up in verse 22, God has just given the Ten Commandments to Israel. These words, the Ten Commandments, the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire. Our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 of the cloud and of the thick darkness with a great voice and he added no more. When he had ceased speaking, he added nothing. And he wrote them in the two tables of stone and delivered them unto me, Moses speaking, the 10 commandments delivered. And it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that you came near unto me even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you know what? They were frightened. They were scared to death. And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he, referring to man, liveth. They had thousands of witnesses that they heard the voice of God. Now, therefore, why should we die? If the Lord pours out his spirit on us again, we're going to die. They believed that. For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that have heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Well, they certainly had and lived. This morning I asked you to hang on to a verse in Acts chapter 2. You remember what it was that happened just before the Holy Spirit spoke that cloven tongue among the disciples? A sound from heaven came as the rushing mighty wind. I don't want any of you hearing that sound of the mighty rushing wind and saying, oh my gosh, if we hear that again, we're all going to die. Be scared. Be frightened. I want you to soak up the Holy Spirit when it's poured out upon you. Then you will have the strength and courage that the judges of Israel had. You'll have the capability of prophesying. What are you going to prophesy? Well, we don't know. It depends on what the Holy Spirit gives us in that very minute. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, the people continue to Moses, 
and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee. Moses, you go and listen to the word of God. And then you come back and tell us what he said. We're afraid to. And we will hear it and do it right. You know, that's something man's not very good at. We can talk the talk, but it's kind of hard to walk the walk. We say we will do things God's way, but oftentimes we end up doing the wrong thing, as Paul would teach in the New Testament. No matter how hard I try to do that which is right, it always seems like I end up doing that which is wrong. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spake unto me. He heard your promise that you would do his will. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Soon they would be making golden calves. But it pleased the Lord that at least they said they would do his will. I'm sure he wasn't very pleased that they were afraid of him. Oh, that there were such an heart in them, the Lord continues, that they would fear me, that they would revere me, and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. God knew their hearts, and guess what? He knows your heart as well. Go say to them, get ye into your tents again. They lived in tents at this time. This just means tell them to go home. But as for thee, Moses, stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments, which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I live, give uh, them to possess it. The law, the statutes, and the ordinances. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 32. Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Don't allow anything to distract you and, and take you off focus, off to the right or to the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the lands which ye shall possess. Do you, would you like to have that, that it be well with you? and your days be prolonged, then do things God's way. The Spirit of the Lord was poured out on Gideon, one of our judges. Uh, would Gideon soak it up? Turn with me to Judges chapter 6 as we continue our study on soak it up. Judges chapter 6 verse 1. <clears throat> and the children of Israel did evil. And the language is that this is, they did the evil with the article. That means they committed idolatry. In the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Medan seven years. And according to Bullinger with the 110 year correction, this would be 1225 to 1218 BC. Now, Israel had soundly defeated the Midianites less than 200 years before this came to pass. You can read about that in Numbers chapter 31. But you know, the choice is yours. It actually is. If you want God's blessings, do things His way. If you don't, if you worship idols and have other gods, you can expect him to deliver you into the hand of the enemy. He can deliver you from the enemy or he can deliver you into the hand of the enemy. The choice is yours. And the hand of Medan prevailed, this was, was strong in the Hebrew, against Israel. And because the Medianites, the children of Israel, made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. What this is saying is Israel was hiding food and anything of value from the Midianites because the Midianites were stealing them blind. And so it was when Israel had sown, had sown crops, that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. The Amalekites and the Ishmaelites had become allies to the Midianites. 
And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza, the extreme southwest of the land, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. They stole them blind. For they came up <clears throat> with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers. This is locust. You see the type? Raping the land, causing destruction, causing deception. For multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Again, that type, the locust army of the future, will be entering the land to spiritually destroy it through destruction, through deception, excuse me, and many will be spiritually dead as a result of that locust army. We read about the locust army of the future in Revelation chapter 9 and Joel chapter 2, which we were in this morning. Verse 6, And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Over and over we saw this cycle in the book of Judges. First, Israel would sin by committing idolatry and worshiping other gods. God would sell them or deliver them into the hand of the enemy to oppress them. After a number of years of oppression, the people would finally cry out to the Lord and he would send them a deliverer. That's why in the Judges we see a type for Jesus Christ, the Deliverer. Verse 7, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. The prophet is explaining to them why they have been in bondage to or oppression to the Midianites for the past seven years. God is saying through this prophet, you know, you were Pharaoh's servants and I delivered your fathers from Egypt. Do you remember me? Because they're committing idolatry. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out, referring to the Canaanites and the promised land, from before you and gave you their land. Not only did he give them their land, he gave them their houses. He gave them their vineyards, their olive yards, their wine presses, their watchtowers. Everything was there prepared for them. There were conditions for them to keep it. The conditions weren't being met. That was fidelity to him. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Deuteronomy chapter 7, God said, I'm going to send you into a land that has seven nations stronger than you, the Canaanites, the Amorites being one of those seven. And God said, don't give your daughters to their sons to wed. Don't take their daughters to your sons to wed. Because if you do, you're going to start wish, worshiping their gods. God knew what he was talking about, didn't he? And there came an angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is the Lord himself, 99% of the time, manifesting himself in a way that we in this dimension in the flesh can see him. And sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abiah's right, that's a descendant of Manasseh, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Now generally you thresh grain in an open threshing floor. What we've got going on here is Gideon is hiding in a winepress which is down in the earth trying to beat out enough fruit, uh, grain to make a, a loaf of bread so he and his family can eat. He's afraid that if the Midianites see him, they will steal it. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. 
Now imagine Gideon cowering down in this wine press. And all of a sudden, a stranger, complete stranger, walks up and says, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. <laughs> Are you talking to me? Would be what I would be thinking. I'm sure that's what Gideon was thinking as well. The Lord's telling him, you're going to become a mighty man of valor. He's promising him courage and the victory. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, this is Adon in the Hebrew. It, it means sir. And it can apply to human flesh, man, or it can be divine. And the point is, I don't think Gideon realizes that he's talking to Yahweh. If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of saying? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us. You remember verse 1 where it says they committed the evil in the manuscripts? They committed idolatry. They forsook him before he forsook them being the point and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might. At this point, what is Gideon's might? I think it's knowledge of Yahweh's strength and his own weakness. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And you know what? That's good enough to get the job done. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family, my father's house. Moses was kind of reluctant to take office. He said, O oh Lord, I'm, I'm slow of speech. You need to choose somebody else to, to, to lead Israel into the promised land. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 6. Jeremiah, what did he say? He said, they won't listen to me. I'm but a youth. I'm, I'm, I'm too young. They're not going to listen to me. You need to find somebody else to do that, Lord. Gideon's saying, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least. You better find somebody else to do that, Lord. I don't want to hear any of you saying when you hear that sound of the rushing mighty wind. I don't want to hear any of you saying, Lord, you need to find somebody else. I don't, I don't think I can do that. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. The same promise God made to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. Surely I will be with thee and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. One person can make a difference. And he, Gideon, said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Gideon's going to be asking a lot of signs before we finish this chapter. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee, and he said, I will tarry, or I'll wait until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made it ready a kid, and unleavened cakes, and an ephah, the flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, presented it. The acceptance of this offering is going to be a miraculous sign. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. He obeyed. This rock is going to serve as an altar. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight, disappeared suddenly. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, 
For because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, he thought the same thing that the people of Israel back in Deuteronomy chapter 5 thought. Because he had seen the face of God, he thought he was going to die. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee. Fear not, thou shalt not die. <clears throat> then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Yahweh Shalom unto this day. Yahweh Shalom is uh, God's peace or Yahweh gives peace. Unto this day it is yet at Ophrah of the Abiah's rites until the time of this writing. 25, and it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, to Gideon, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old. Verse one, how many years had Israel been under the oppression of the Midianites? Seven years. And throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, that's Joash by name, and cut down the grove, the Asherah that is by it. You know what Gideon is if you translate it? Cut her down. Do you think God knew when Joash named Gideon what Gideon would become? Boy, I sure do. The cutter down. He cut down the Asherah, the uh, Baal altar and the grove, the two principal deities of the Canaanites. You know, and judges, if you take the, the Hebrew word, is shofetum. It comes from a prime shafat, which means to set things right and rule. And that's what the judges all did. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock, the same rock I think that the fire consumed uh, Gideon's gift in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. Cleaning house and the burnt offering, he was sanctifying his life and labor to the service of the Lord. Then Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household, the Baal worshipers, and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, and that he did it by night. Well, at least he did it. But you see a little bit of lack of faith on the part of Gideon, afraid to do it in the daytime, but under the cover, chose, choosing to do it under the cover of night. And when the men of the city, the Baal worshipers, arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, who hath done this thing? Question. And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joath, hath done this thing. How did they know? Well, there were 10 servants that helped him in verse 27. Obviously, one of them threw Gideon under the bus. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. Bring your boy over, uh, out, turn him over to us, and he's going to die. And Joash, here his father, is going to take Gideon's side, said unto all that stood against him, will ye plead for Baal? You could translate this, are you gonna fight for Baal? Will ye save him? You know, your God should save you. It shouldn't be necessary for you to save your God. He that will plead for him, let him be put to death, whilst it is yet morning. This is saying, wait till tomorrow morning and if Baal has defended his own honor, then he will die. If he be a God, he's not a God. Let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore on that day, he, Joash, called him Gideon, Jerubbabel, saying, let Baal plead against him because he hath thrown down his altar. This became an honorary name, Jerubbabel for Gideon, meaning that he fought against Baal and Baal could do Gideon no harm. 
Listen up for me. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together. Remember back in verse 5, they came as grasshoppers. They were with their camels that were without number, gathered together and went over. They went over the Jordan and pitched in the valley Jezreel. Things are going to be a lot different than what they've gone on the last seven years. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. God poured out His Spirit upon Gideon. And he blew a trumpet, a call to war. And Abiezer was gathered after him. Abiezer, his own family, they were the first to answer the call to war. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers into Asher, and into Zebulun, and into Naphtali, and they came up to meet them, them being the Manassites. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, Gideon's going to ask for two more signs. Pretty bold of Gideon. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, the threshing floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. A fleece is a single piece of shorn wool uh, from the sheep. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together. He squeezed the fleece and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And it was dry on the threshing floor around. When God pours his spirit out upon all flesh, I want every one of you to be as absorbent as that fleece of wool. Absorb all of the Holy Spirit off the threshing floor. Make sure you get every last little bit of it and you'll do just fine. And Gideon said unto God, let not thine anger be hot against me and I will speak but this once, this once more. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. You know, the purpose of the two messages today, this morning's message, this mes the message that you're listening to now, is to hopefully help you prepare for Antichrist coming. And you know, we would have to search diligently to find a better type for the return of Antichrist than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Daniel has just solved the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And the last verse of chapter 2 it states that Daniel requested the king, that's Nebuchadnezzar, set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were promoted. I think it probably caused some jealousy among the other servants of Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. It was 60 cubits. And the breadth thereof, six cubits. This image has 666 written all over it, just like Goliath had 666 written all over him in 1 Samuel chapter 17. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces. These are all political offices to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. 
a type for the political beast of Revelation chapter 13? I think so. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. They're getting ready to have a real religious hoedown. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 4, then an herald, this is a, uh, to proclaim, uh, the word is karaz, and it means to make a proclamation, cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. Whoa, what do we got here? Nations, plural, languages, plural. Are we talking about a one world order? I think you see the picture. That at what time you hear the sound of the coronet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, how many instruments? Six, 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 all over this. And all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Ooh, that sounds scary. You know what, beloved? That's the reason you need to make up your mind right now what you're going to do in that instant. A lot of people uh, would be tempted to say, boy, that sounds awful, being cast into a, a, a fiery burning furnace. You know what, though? If you soak up the Holy Spirit that God pours out upon you, you'll gain courage and strength to say no to that. You see, this image is nothing but a type for Antichrist. Are you going to bow a knee, even under the threat of being thrown into a fiery burning furnace? Not if you soak up the Spirit. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, and the psaltery, I don't know what happened to the dulcimer player. I guess maybe it was potty break time. And all kinds of music, all the people, the nations and the languages, plural. Got the picture? One world fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar uh, the king had set up. Well, almost all. There'll be three young Hebrews who won't. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans, these are the Babylonians spoke five different dialects of Chaldee, so don't let that throw you. Chaldeans are Babylonians, came near and accused the Jews. They're accusing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Typical greeting to a king. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, Sack but sultry and dulcimer, potty break over, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Again, I'll ask you, will you fall down and worship the image, the Antichrist? Not if you absorb the spirit, not if you soak it up. And whoso falleth not down and worship, that he should be cast in the midst of a burning fiery a furnace. Oh, it's not looking good for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There are certain Jews, they continue to the king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. You think we might be a little jealous here? I think they are. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have no, not, not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Many of you will be brought before a king as well. He's called the Antichrist. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, 
nor worship the golden image which I have set up. I think Nebuchadnezzar sounds a little hurt that they're not worshiping his image. Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well, or, or good. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast that same hour, a type for the hour of temptation, you won't be tempted into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Yahweh is his name. He will deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just as he will deliver you from any threats. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. This is not a very good translation at all. If you have a companion Bible, note that Bullinger says that this should have been translated, do not even account us needful of answering your question. In other words, we're not even, don't even think about us changing our minds. We're not worshiping the image that you set up. If it be so, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego continue, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will, we see faith there, deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Pretty bold? Yes, I think so. Will you be able to speak that boldly to the Antichrist? If you soak up the spirit that is poured out on you, you will. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage, this is his countenance, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont or necessary to be heated. Nebuchadnezzar was hot. He wanted the furnace made hot. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. A type here, I think we see Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. What do you have there? You have the ten crowns. That's the 10 kings. You also have 6,990 Nephilim that are all going to die, 7,000 that will die according to Revelation chapter 11, just as soon as Christ descends at the second advent. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. They had on their coats, their hosen, and their hats. These are all symbolic of the gospel armor of Ephesians chapter 6. And you had better have your loins girt about with truth, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, and most of all, the shield of faith where you can withstand the fiery darts of Satan. This fiery furnace, you see, is symbolic of the fiery darts of Satan. This fiery furnace had no effect whatsoever on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? Because they had soaked up the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And guess what? If you stand with that gospel armor in place, and soak up all of the Holy Spirit, those fiery darts of Satan will have no impact on you whatsoever either. Verse 22, therefore because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was so hot, it killed those that the king instructed to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And there they were. Do you know what they were doing? 
They were singing the song of the three children. Do you have a copy of the Apocrypha? Read the song of three children. The last verse of the song of three children reads, which ends bless him all ye who worship the Lord, the God of gods, sing praise to him and give thanks uh, unto him for his mercy endureth forever. That's the song they were singing. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, his governors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto him, to the king, true, O king, yes, yes we did. He, Nebuchadnezzar, answered and said, lo, I see four men loose, no longer bound, they're loose, free, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. How did Nebuchadnezzar know that that looked like the Son of God? I guess once you've seen him, you know him. Nebuchadnezzar, you know the rest of this. That fire had didn't send your hair didn't even add the smell of smoke to the clothing of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar put forth a proclamation that said, anyone who speaks evil of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, let him be cut into pieces and his house turned into a dunghill. I said earlier that if you soak up the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that you can speak boldly. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4, New Testament. Acts chapter 4, let's pick it up with verse 1. And as they, this referring to Peter and the apostles, spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Important to remember, the Sadducees don't believe in life after death. Being grieved, or they were angry, that they, the apostles, taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That wouldn't set well, especially with the Sadducees. And they laid hands on them and put them in the hole that's in jail under the next day, for it was now evening tide. Nice religious leaders, what? You know, many of you are going to be cast into prison, as it's written in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. The church was growing. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, verse 6, and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, members of the Sanhedrin, no doubt, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priests were gathered together at Jerusalem. And remember, all of these weren't Levites. These were appointed by the Roman government. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? And what they're talking about is, there was a 40-year-old man who had been crippled from the womb. And they healed him in chapter 3 in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that's what they're asking. What are your credentials exactly? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, God poured out his Spirit on Peter. And Peter soaked it up. And said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole. Again, this referring to the 40-year-old man who was crippled from the womb. If, if you're asking us how that happened, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Back in chapter 3, verse 6, they said, in, Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
rise up and walk. And this one who wasn't able to walk for 40 years sprung up. But it's Jesus whom you crucified. I'll bet a lot of them are saying, "Uh uh-oh. Verse 11, this is the stone, Peter continues, or the Holy Spirit through Peter, probably better said, continues. This is the stone which was set at naught. It's the stone that was rejected of ye builders, which has become the head of the corner. And of, Christ, and of course, Christ is the head cornerstone. Psalm 118, 22, Isaiah 28, 16. Neither is there salvation in any other. Only in the name of Jesus Christ is there salvation. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only one way, Jesus Christ. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, if you absorb the Holy Spirit, if you soak it up, you can be bold in your talk. And perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. You know, they're going to think the same thing about many of us. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus Christ. They studied with Jesus. Uh, They had a gift from God. That was all the credentials they needed. The Holy Spirit was speaking through them as well. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. They couldn't discredit what had been done. It's kind of hard to argue with miracles. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. They plotted secretly, saying, What shall we do to these men? For then indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest. Everyone knows to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Everyone saw the miracle. We can't call them fakes. But that it, referring to Christianity, spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Don't you speak in the name of Jesus anymore. You think they will obey? I don't. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. You judge, but we think God would be more pleased if we did what was right in his sight, not what was right in your sight or any other man. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard from Jesus. So when they had further threatened them, and if you read on in chapter 5, verse 40, they did stop with threatening them. They beat them and told them not to speak in the name Jesus anymore. They let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. The people weren't going to let any nonsense happen. They saw what happened, the miracle. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old, the impotent man who was healed, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. It's critical in conclusion that you soak up every bit that you can of the Holy Spirit, because not to do so could cause you to commit the unforgivable sin. In conclusion, turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we're going to pick it up with verse 4. We, we end the, the lessons today with the words of Jesus. Luke chapter 12, verse 4, and it reads, And I say unto ye, my friends. I like that. Jesus said, I say unto you, my friends. Do you consider yourself to be a friend of Jesus? He does. Be not afraid of them that kill the body. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the flesh body. And after that, have no more that they can do. Even if they throw you in a burning, fiery furnace, they can't kill your soul. 
They can kill your flesh, but they cannot kill your soul. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. This is who you should fear or revere. Fear him which after he hath killed the flesh, I'll add, hath power to cast the soul into hell. Yea, I say unto ye, fear him. There's only one entity that has the power to kill both the flesh and the soul. That's your heavenly father. Verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Two farthings was an insignificant amount of money. But the sparrows weren't insignificant to our Heavenly Father. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Yes, even the gray ones. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Don't get over anxious. Don't worry. God was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that burning, fiery furnace. God is going to be with you when you're delivered up before the Antichrist. You see, it's His will that's going to be accomplished, and you're the ones that are going to help accomplish that will. Do you think He's not going to help you every way that He can? Of course He will. Also, I say unto you, Jesus continues, Whosoever shall confess me, being Jesus, before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Your, book, your name is in the book of life. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. The reason we came here, verse 10, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, that's Jesus while he was in the flesh here on earth, it shall be forgiven him. That, that's forgivable. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. The Lord is going to pour out his Spirit on all flesh. Many of you have a destiny, and that's to be delivered up and witness for Jesus Christ. Do you have to worry about what you're going to say? No. It's not going to be you talking. It's the Holy Spirit. So don't get nervous. Don't get upset. Don't get excited. But most of all, don't refuse to soak up that spirit that's being poured out. And when they bring you into the synagogues, this is the synagogues of Satan, Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. And unto magistrates and powers, Take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. You remember this morning in our lesson, Acts chapter 2, what did the apostles speak? They spoke that cloven tongue as the Spirit gave them utterance. Don't ever forget that. As the Spirit gives you the words. The Spirit's going to put the words in your mouth. Mark chapter 13, verse 11, take no thought beforehand what ye shall say. Verse 12, continue to, to complete the lecture. For the Holy Spirit shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. And that's when you want to make sure that you are absorbing everything that the Lord is pouring out. I want you to remember Gideon's fleece at that moment. I want you to be absorbent as Gideon's fleece was with that dew. Remember Gideon picked it up and squeezed it and the dew filled a bowl? That's how absorbent I want you to be when the Spirit of God is poured out on all flesh. Soak it up. Let's go to his throne. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father, your word that tells us how to be pleasing to you, Father, that gives us so many types and examples of, of things that are going to happen in the future, Father. Give us the wisdom to understand your word, Father. We are appreciative of that. Uh, be with us the rest of this weekend, Father. Tomorrow we have a very, very special day coming up with the Holy Communion. We ask you to bless that table uh, even at this time. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? 
Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Parentheses. I would like to know where in the Bible it tells about the native American people. Thanks and may God bless you all. I mentioned earlier that there were people who were created in Genesis chapter 1, the sixth day creation. We refer to them here at the chapel. Um, they are, uh, God was very pleased with that creation as it states in the last verse. Native American Indians are part of that generation. By the way, we offer a book here at the chapel called North American Sun Kings. I would encourage anyone of Native American ancestry to order that book. Out of time, I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. It makes your Father's Day when you take time to read the letter he wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, beloved, it's this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.